longest afternoon, the 400 men who decided the Battle of Waterloo by Brandon Sims. I'm going to read the first three chapters of this here for this segment, and then we'll go from there. <clears throat> Just a section of the preface. Regarding Waterloo, it, it says, This drama has been told often and told well. One crucial aspect of the battle, however, has been relatively neglected. The epic defense of the farm of La Hassin, at the center of the Allied line by the men of the 2nd Light Battalion's King German Legion, thanks to the availability of new sources, including unpublished material in the Hanoverian archives, we now know much more about these 400-odd riflemen. They were motivated by a combination of ideological opposition to Napoleonic tyranny, dynastic loyalty to the King of England, German patriotism, regimental camaraderie, personal bonds of friendship, and professional ethos. These men and their reinforcements held off Napoleon for long enough to change the course of the battle. This is their story. And then we'll start with chapter one, which is entitled Prelude. <coughs> Belgium, early afternoon, Saturday, 17th of June, 1815. The French have worsted Marshal Blucher's Prussians at Ligny and the Duke of Wellington's Allied army at the crossroads of Quatre Bras the day before. Now Napoleon is m making haste to destroy Wellington's retreating army before he can unite with Blucher. Mercifully, the riflemen of the 2nd Light Battalion of the King's German Legion had missed the battle at Quatre Bras the day before. But they witnessed its appalling aftermath, a horrible field of corpses, literally swimming in blood, which at every step went over our ankles, in the words of rifleman Friedrich Lindau. The general feeling, as Lieutenant Emanuel Biedermann called, recalled, was that Napoleon had caught the Allied army napping. Contrary to myth, however, none of the brigade officers were still in the clothes they had worn to the Duchess of Richmond's ball in Brussels a few days earlier. At around 2 p.m., the 2nd Light Battalion was detailed to relieve the skirmishers holding off the pursuing French and withdraw. Together with their fellow riflemen of the British 95th Regiment, they formed the rear guard for the entire Allied army. Starving and exhausted, the Germans rested in a meadow near Genappe. Despite the fact that they were told to prepare for a French attack, most of the men promptly fell asleep. They were soon woken, however, by a sudden thunderstorm and downpour. Then a detachment of Brunswick Hussars galloped up and told them they must withdraw immediately, as the enemy was already encroaching on all sides. The Germans now retreated at the double through sunken roads, which the rain had turned into streams and muddy cornfields, towards the military road which led to Brussels. Once past Genappe, where the water reached to their knees, the battalion was ordered to keep the highway free for the retreating Allied cavalry and artillery. The riflemen continued to march in the fields on either side of the road, through high corn and soil soft from the downpour. As they trudged northwards, the Germans pressed together more closely in order to minimize their exposure to the driving rain. Against the leaden skies and the thunder and lightning of the elements, the flash and crash of artillery continued to light up the horizon and reverberate across the fields. At regular intervals, Allied horsemen charged past them in order to drive off the encroaching French cavalry and skirmishers. By the end of the day, the riders were so soiled that the riflemen could no longer tell from their uniforms whether they were friends or foe. At times, the French advanced within a few hundred paces of the Germans. On more than one occasion, the battalion was forced to halt and deploy in square, the sides bristling with their distinctive sword bayonets, in order to deter enemy cavalry. They would have been surprised to read Wellington's later dispatch to the effect that the enemy had not attempted to molest our march to the rear after Quetre Bras. The Germans were still better off than the unfortunate Belgian civilians who were attempting to escape the advancing French. <laughs> Lieutenant Baderman pitied the men who were driving their cattle before them, others bearing bundles, women carrying or pulling their children after them, all fleeing, moaning, and weeping. It was about half past seven in the evening of Saturday, 17th of June, when the first riflemen reached the heights of Mont Saint-Jean near the village of Waterloo. By the time the last legionnaires arrived, it was dark. Though the night sky was occasionally illuminated by muzzle flashes and the air was punctuated by gunfire and shouted orders as the retreating columns were marshaled at the crossroads just beyond the substantial farmhouse of La Hassan, which stood adjacent to the Brussels-Charleroi road named at Counts Differ 
either after the crown of thorns worn by Christ at his crucifixion, or more prosaically, after a brambled hedge which enclosed a nearby meadow. It was later still when the 400 or so Germans received word that they were to occupy the farm. The retreat was over. La Hesson, the farm in which the second light battalion was to fight its most celebrated action, consisted of a stable, a piggery, a barn, a substantial farmhouse, a low wall and a pond arranged around a large courtyard. It was a common enough type of dwelling for the area. The farmer and his family had fled. The house was large with walls and places more than a meter thick and high ceilings. There were large dormer windows on the first story and hay and straw on the floor above, which had no windows. A passage led through the stable to the fields on the western side. The main gate and wicket gate gave access to the road to the east. A passage and two doors opened onto the kitchen garden immediately north of the house. Its northern and western sides were surrounded by a hedge and the eastern side, which gave on to the road by a wall. The garden contained a wall and an outhouse. Just to the south of the main buildings was a large orchard, three sides of which were enclosed by another hedge, and the fourth by a large barn, about 30 meters long, and a low wall through which a gate led into the courtyard. <clears throat> the buildings themselves were undamaged, but because La Hesson lay just beside the main Allied line of withdrawal, it had already been plundered by passing soldiers. Most importantly, they had torn down the barn door opening onto the field to the left to provide firewood for some of the thousands of miserable men camped in the countryside around. Captain Jonathan Leach of the 95th Rifles just across the road described sleeping on ground so boggy that it resembled a snipe marsh. Rifleman Simon Lehman of the 1st Light Battalion, who spent the night in the sunken road behind the farm, must also have been extremely uncomfortable. Unfortunately for the Germans, most of the hay in the outbuildings was also carried away. The animals, however, were slaughtered and the meat was shared with the neighboring Lion Battalion of the Legion. The riflemen overlooked the calf and the piggery, however. <clears throat> the men showed little interest in the food. For the moment, the main priority was to stay or to get dry. The lucky ones were able to take shelter within the buildings. <clears throat> Private Friedrich Lindau was one of, the, one of those who drew the short straw. His company was sent to the orchard where there was virtually no protection from the elements and where they were so close to the enemy that the soldiers were fi forbidden to light a fire. Lindau did, however, succeed in making off with a pocket full of peas he found in the farmhouse. <clears throat> Most of the riflemen, though, had fallen into a stupor, their senses numbed by a tiredness, hunger, and the incessant rain. Rather than lie in the damp, they leant against walls and trees or sat on their knapsacks, staring vacantly into space. Even outside the main buildings, few tried to light a fire, admittedly, no easy matter in the downpour, or to cook the fresh meat they had been issued. Instead, they warmed themselves with alcohol. The enterprising Lindau sneaked into the cellar and made off with a canteen of wine, which he shared with his comrades and with soldiers of the 1st Light Battalion stationed nearby. It wasn't long before Germans who had bivouacked further away, such as Corporal Meyer and the Bremen Field Battalion, came to scrounge some drink as well. Repeated return trips to the cellar ensured that the men in the orchard and probably much of the rest of the garrison were well supplied with alcohol. Eventually, Lindau lay down for the night at the far end of the orchard facing the enemy, his rifle at the ready. Lieutenant Emanuel Biederman, who was also trying to sleep among the trees, recalls that now quiet and a deep pace followed the racket of the day. On the other side of the valley, the pursuing French also settled in for the night. Many of them were Napoleonic veterans of many years standing, others, uh, other young recruits. Their personal loyalty to the emperor was often fervent. Two days before the battle, the advancing columns observed a young soldier, or rather a trunk of a man, who had two legs taken off by a cannonball, as well as severe face and chest wounds which had not yet healed. On seeing his comrades, the unfortunate lifted his hands and called out, Long live the emperor! I have lost my two legs, but I don't care! Victory is ours. Long live the emperor. Like their German counterparts, the French spent the afternoon and night of 17th of June in the rain around sputtering campfires. The night was terrible, the French commander opposite Le Hesson recalls. Rain falls in abundance, which made the maneuvering of artillery very difficult. The man had spent the night with, without shelter. Nobody had been able to make a fire. It was too wet to cook, so men like Corporal Candler of the 28th Line Regiment held on to the sheep they had captured nearby and the small square of butter he had picked up the day before. He and his comrades were part of Bourgeois' 2nd Brigade on Alex's 1st Division. 
One of four in Darlan's first corps, like the Germans in La Haison, Darlan's men had taken no part in the fighting at Quetta Le Bras, having wasted the day marching fruitlessly back and forth through the contradictory orders. After being reproached by Napoleon, as he recalled, in a very chagrined tone, Darlan was determined not to be found wanting again. As they bedded down for the night, the riflemen at La Haison knew that there would probably be a major engagement once the French main force arrived. Lieutenant Biederman remembers seeing many of the men deep in, th in thought that night. I too wondered, he writes, whether I would see my homeland and my dear ones again, or whether an enemy's sword would propel me out of my unsettled life. At the threshold of death, the past and the future appear in a much more serious light than otherwise. Neither Bitterman, Lindau, nor the rest of the battalion, however, could have foreseen just how severely they would be tested the following day. Chapter 2, For King and Fatherland The Germans of the 2nd Light Battalion had come a long way. They were not just in La Haison because they were there. The road to Waterloo began 12 years before in 1803, when their Hanoverian homeland in northern Germany was overrun by Napoleon. Many had entered the new King's German Legion, or KGL, established by their ruler, George III of England, who was also Elector of Hanover towards the end of that year. Others joined later to escape the rigors of the French occupation, traveling from Hamburg via Hosum and Heligoland, or via Barth near Stralsund in Swedish Pomerania. The two rifle units, the first and the second light battalions, were the very first to be established. The line, artillery, and cavalry formations followed later as more and more recruits arrived in Britain from the continent. The flow slowed to a trickle in 1809 uh, slash 1810 as the occupation authorities clamped down and in 1811-1812 several Hanoverians were executed by the French for recruiting for the Legion. It was envisaged that many different nationalities would enlist in the Legion. In 1811 the British War Office laid down that the Legion should rec recruit none but such as are natives of Germany and speak or at least understand German including all German countries which are now incorporated with France. Likewise, the possessions of the House of Austria and those which belonged formerly to Russia and Holland, the enlistment of, quote, French, Italians, Danes, Swedes, Russians, Spaniards, or Portuguese was explicitly ruled out. At Waterloo, the line battalions were the most mixed, with about 50% of the rank and file coming from German territories other than Hanover, especially Prussia, and despite the war office's injunctions, even Russia and Denmark. <clears throat> Generally speaking, the proportion of Hanoverians in the light battalions was higher, making them more homogenous and very likely also more cohesive. All the same, about one-third of the men in the La Haison hailed from Prussia, Bavaria, and other parts of the old Holy Roman Empire, and there were even Poles such as Alexander Dobrysky of the Third Company and Fleming such as Baptiste Charrier of the Fifth Company. Wherever they came from, the men who enlisted in the 2nd Light Battalion had embarked on an odyssey leading from Hanover via the Legion's English base camp at Bexhill on the Channel Coast, expeditions to northern Germany, and garrison duty in Ireland in 1805 to 1806, to the Baltic in 1807 through 1808, the Iberian Peninsula in 1808 through 1809, to the Scheldt in 1809, back to the Peninsula in 1811 through 1813, through southern France and the shadow of the mobilization after Napoleon's exile to Elba to the slopes of Mont Saint-Jean in Belgium. Unlike most of the foreign formations which fought in the coalitions against Napoleon, the King's German Legion was part of the British regular army. For those not already in royal service, commissions were temporary until August 1810 and were then made permanent by Act of Parliament in recognition of the Legion's services in the peninsula. Some of its officers were British, especially in the 2nd Light Battalion, as were the paymasters. Its bankers were the London firm of Greenwood, Cox and Company, and Craig's Court off Whitehall, eventually absorbed into Lloyd's Bank. The language of command was generally English, as was the rank structure. The men of the 2nd Light Battalion were equipped with standard-issue Baker rifles, and they wore the same distinctive green jackets as the British riflemen. They enlisted in Britain. Recruits were paid the same bounty as the king's other subjects. They swore the same oath and were, as the official proclamation put it, generally subject to the same regulations and articles of war as the Majesty's British troops. The Legion adopted the 
English enthusiasm for phys physical exercise, such as rowing, wrestling, stick fencing, and boxing, and team sports such as football and cricket. The officers could avail themselves of a progressive military education and were allowed to attend artillery courses in arithmetic, drawing, geometry, geography, and fortifications. The Germans never served as a single corps, but were always brigaded with other British units on operations, though at Waterloo, their divisional commander, Sir Charles von Olsen, was a Hanoverian. By Waterloo, the Legion had more than a decade of combat experience fighting alongside the rest of Wellington's army. Of a total of some 30,000 legionnaires who served throughout the conflict, about 1,300 were killed in action, with nearly 5,900 dying from all causes. The two light battalions were unusual within the legion in that they never completely adopted British drill regulations or the English language. German remained in use throughout the second light battalion, but English was prescribed for sentry duty where it was vital to avoid misunderstandings and on parade. Majors and adjutants were chosen with their knowledge of English in mind. Many of the officers were already fluent. Those who were not took private lessons, often with female tutors, in which they made great strides. Some officers who had begun their diaries in German completed them in English. They often switched between the two languages in conversation and correspondence. For example, table on losses, in addition to the fighting strength, as entries under joined and total effectiveness, as well as gestorben, which means died, and verab scheidet ohen pension, which means discharged without a pension. Some senior officers, such as General von Alden, who commanded the Light Division in Spain, and Sir Julius von Hartmann, reinvented themselves as hybrid Anglo German gentlemen, affecting the manners and dress of their hosts. It was also common for the rank and file to adopt or to be given. English first names. One list has a John Hennes, a Frederick Almutz, and a Henry Ebeling, as well as the more German Wilhelm Witz. So by Waterloo, even the Germans, quote-unquote, second light battalion of the King's German Legion had effectively become bilingual. We would nowadays describe it as an agent of cultural transfer. <clears throat> the 18th century forebears of the Hanoverians, the auxiliary regiments deployed in England during the French invasion, Scares of the Seven Years' War had been despite as agents of despised as agents of royal despotism. These sentiments had attenuated but by no means evaporated by the Revolutionary and Napoleonic period. The radical William Kobe was imprisoned as late as 1810 in the aftermath of his diatribes against the King's German Legion. For this reason, the King's German Legion was regarded with some trepidation when it marched to its depot at Bexhill on the south coast of England, camping on the village commons en route. When two officers passed a couple of farmers on the way to the pub, they overheard the following conversation. Where are you going, Jack? One asked. We're going to the common to see the wild Germans, the other answered. Upon their return to the camp, they found the, man, the men eating, observed by astonished locals. Look at them, the locals cried. They have spoons, knives, and forks like ourselves. Soon, however, legion was accepted at all levels of English society. Their strong musical traditions, in particular, made an impression on the population. Many of the officers in rank and file married local girls. One of them was Captain Philip Holzerman of the 1st Light Battalion, later posted just beside La Haison, who wed Mary Ann Pomfrey, daughter of the customs officer at Bexhill in 1812. Others were Rifleman Henry Bush, or Bush as he was baptized, regarding spelling, of the 2nd Light Battalion, who married Harriet Hasselden in September 1810, and Rifleman George, or Gottfried, Heinz, also of the 2nd Light Battalion, who married local girl Mary Ann Burt in January 1813. Even today, the streetscape of Bexhill on Sea, as it is now called, records the connection. The barracks and the Germans are long gone, but there's still a barrack road, a Hanover Close nearby, and a Hanover House on the old high street. <clears throat> the legend had a distinctive ethos. Relations between officers and men were closer than in most British formations. The general tone in the memoir literature is respectful and affectionate on both sides. This also seems to have applied to officers of a British origin, perhaps because they tended to be men from less smart backgrounds who could not afford or obtain a commission in one of the more prestigious English or Scottish regiments. Indeed, the Legion was unusual in that commissions could not be bought. Moreover, many men of the King's German Legion, far from being mere continental mercenaries in the King's pay, 
perceive themselves as ideological warriors against Napoleon and French domination generally. They pointed refused to join, pointedly refused to join the French-sponsored Hanoverian Legion, which would have been a much more convenient choice of career. The second light battalion certainly expressed none of the grudging admiration for Boney, which one often found in British ranks, or the ideological sympathies for the Napoleonic project frequently expressed by other Germans, for example, in the Rhineland. Likewise, the rank and file perceived themselves not as the scum of the earth, for whom military service was simply an escape from poverty or incarceration, nor simply as honest military professionals for whom service was a lifelong occupation, but as free Germans and loyal subjects of the Elector King who had volunteered to rid their land of the French scourge. In this, they resembled the Free French of General de Gaulle during the Second World War. Thus, Julius von Hartmann refused to collaborate with the French and condemned the, quote, fearfulness and lack of character, end quote, of those who did so. Friedrich Haneke, who recruited for the Legion in North Germany, spoke of the, quote, patriotic sentiment, end quote, of the enemy, of the men, their mighty bitterness against the hereditary enemy, and their determination to fight against Napoleon and to cast off the yoke of French tyranny. One surgeon of the Legion wrote of leaving his native town of Minden in order to breathe more freely in free England and to provide myself with a future while my prospects at home were obscured by a sinister veil. Such sentiments were shared by ordinary soldiers such as Rifleman Friedrich Lindau of the 2nd Light Battalion who spoke of his implacable resentment against France and the French. The patriotism applied not only to the Hanoverians but to the other Germans as well, even the Swiss Emmanuel Biedermann a lieutenant of the 2nd Light Battalion spoke of his desire to, quote, drive out the French who had no respect for any international law and look forward to we Germans and Swiss having an active role in the wars of liberation on the soil of the fatherland. These feelings chimed with those of the Legion's British officers. Whatever his private reservations against these heavy, selfish Germans, Lieutenant Edmund Wheatley of the 5th Line Battalion noted that they were all at Waterloo to deal out thunder and confusion to the opposers of the English Constitution. The King's German Legion, in short, was an Anglo-German hybrid designed to tap into the human resources of the old Holy Roman Empire in order to expel the French and to restore German liberty and the European balance of power. The Legionnaires were a socially diverse group, even among the officers. Georges Hartog Gerson, who joined the Legion as a hospital assistant, came from a long line of Jewish doctors in Altona near Hamburg. His grandfather had been in charge of the Jewish hospital there, and his father and elder brothers were medical doctors as well. He studied at Berlin in the Hanoverian University of Gottingen, securing a medical doctorate in April of 1810. A year later, not long after entering the Legion, Gerson was commissioned as assistant surgeon to the 5th Line Battalion of the King's German Legion. He served in the peninsula and southern France. In June of 1815, his regiment formed part of the 2nd King's German Legion Infantry Brigade, commanded by the legendary Christian von Omteda. Indeed, the Omtedas epitomized the Hanoverian struggle against Napoleon. <clears throat> Christian Friedrich von Omteda was a major in the Hanoverian Guards Regiment when his country was overrun by the French in 1803. He joined the Legion as soon as it was formed and served in northern Germany and against the Danes in 1807 and during a brief period of captivity after being shipwrecked off the Dutch coast. Taking command of the 1st Light Battalion in October 1812, Olmteda fought with distinction in the peninsula and southern France. Despite a tendency towards excitability and nervous disorder, which periodically forced him to take extraordinary leave, he became commander of the 2nd King's German Legion Brigade. His younger brother, Ludwig Karl Georges von Olmteda, served as a Hanoverian envoy tirelessly fighting Napoleon on the diplomatic front. During the Waterloo campaign, he was ambassador to Prussia, whose forces were hastening to Wellington's aid in Belgium. The wars against Napoleon had already claimed a heavy price from the family. Their cousin, Captain Ferdinand von Amtetta, fell ill on active service and died in October of 1809 at Egham near Windsor. <clears throat> Another cousin, Captain August von Amtetta, was killed in action in Elva, Portugal in April of 1811. Just before setting out on the Waterloo campaign, Christian learned that his much-loved third brother, Ferdinand, a fellow officer in the Legion, had died after a short illness. My dear Ludwood, he wrote to his surviving brother, the three-cornered clover leaf, the family emblem, 
held for half a century. Christian recalled Ferdinand's quiet sensibility and love with skillful handling of differences arising from fate and my own unstable temperament, which had sustained the brothers through thick and thin. Now that Ferdinand was lost, he enjoined Ludwig at, that they should tie their bonds closer and tighter than ever, and not allow the autumn of their lives to rob the leaves of their family symbol of its living freshness. The sight of the three-sided clover, Christian felt, would be a constant reminder of our loss. In practical terms, he was anxious about the future of his dead brother's sons, the two eldest of whom were serving for the interim with the fifth line battalion. Christian believed that they were good and full of goodwill, but the young, too young to fight, the youngest only being 14. Their safety was to be a preoccupation for him in the days ahead. Old Teta looked forward to the fight with confidence, however, as he would be serving in the division of his old friend, Charles von Alton, with whom fate had brought him together again. The men in La Haison formed a part of a on Teta's Second King's German Brigade. Usually, the Second Light Battalion was commanded by Lieutenant Colonel David Martin. He was, however, absent at Waterloo. His place was taken by Major George Baring. The youngest son of a Hanoverian administrator, he spent most of his childhood engaged in various forms of rebellion and trying to avoid the private tuition arranged by his father. When Baring turned 12, <clears throat> he decided to become a soldier. His father agreed on condition that he join the infantry because he could not afford to equip his son for a cavalry regiment. Service in the Hanoverian army did not put an end to Baring's japes, however, not all of them very amusing from a present day perspective. These included a prank against an elderly Jewess who had not wanted to lend money, who was buried under a pile of planks heaped against her door. He was involved in a number of affairs of honor over women, in the first of which he sustained a sword injury to an arm. In a later duel, Baring disfigured an unfortunate antagonist, the once handsome Ensign von Doschenhausen, by slashing him from the ear to the mouth. He received his baptism of fire in September of 1793 against the French Revolutionary Armies in Flanders and was so badly wounded that he was initially given up for dead. An enemy bullet plowed through his mouth and cheek, knocking out four of his teeth. Pus continued to pour through his nose and ears for years afterwards. Despite this experience, Baring returned to service as soon as he recovered. The Hanoverian collapse of 1803 left him adrift, like many, he felt that he could not stay among the French. Moreover, after 16 years in the army, he now had and was nothing. It was time for a radical decision, so Baring became involved in recruiting for the King's German Legion and soon joined it himself. He fought in North Germany, the Baltic, Walcheren, the Iberian Peninsula, and southern France. In May of 1811, Baring's particularly distinguished himself in Spain where he suffered a minor injury during the brutal struggle for the village of Albura. He served as aide de camp to Charles von Alten in the peninsula and appears to have been somewhat in awe of him. Later, Bering was made a major in the 2nd Light Battalion and seems to have been liked and respected by his men who had already followed him into battle and possible death or injury on many previous occasions. Their loyalty, however, was about to receive its hardest test yet. Chapter 3, A Tragedy of Errors the Duke of Wellington, who was informed in the early hours of 18th of June that the Prussians would come to his aid later that day, decided to give battle. He knew the ground well, having reconnoitered it recently. Although Wellington would have preferred to fight at Rosson further south, the heights of Mont Saint Jean, where Quartermaster de Lancé had halted the retreat, was also an excellent defensive position. It was bounded on both sides by fortifiable buildings. The slopes themselves allowed him to conceal his infantry well and provided a good field of fire. At 6 a.m., the Duke left his headquarters at Waterloo and headed for the battlefield. An hour later, Wellington embarked on an inspection of the Allied position. Anxious to prevent Napoleon from cutting him off from the sea, he posted a large detachment further west at Hall. These 18,000 men or so took no further part in operations. On the battlefield itself, he sent the Elite Guards Brigade and some Nassauers to the modest chateau of Hugomont and its environment on his right, western flank. He was so concerned to hold this position that additional engineering units, including those of the King's German Legion, were dispatched to fortify the buildings. His left, or eastern flank, rested in the villages of Le Haisson, or Le Haye, and Papelet. 
Uh, in the center, the Duke posted violence and experienced Dutch Belgian brigade on the forward slope just to the east of La Haison. Most of the rest of the army was deployed on the reverse slopes along the ridge on both sides of the farmhouse with the weaker elements to the left closest to where the Prussians relief column was expected. <clears throat> the Allied center, the vital area around the crossroads and La Haison, was assigned to the 3rd British Infantry Division under the command of General Charles von Alten and in particular to Alteda's 2nd King's German Legion Brigade. Most of them had not fought at Quatrebois and were thus relatively fresh. The 1st Light Rifle Battalion of the King's German Legion, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Louis von den Busch, was placed immediately to the right of the crossroads. One of their number was the recently married Captain Philip Holzerman. Behind them lay Lieutenant Colonel von Schrader's 8th Line Battalion of the Legion. To their right was the Legion's 5th Line Battalion under Lieutenant Colonel von Lensingen. Just beyond them lay Lundberg Light Battalion, the Lundberg Light Battalion of the Hanoverian Army, which had been reconstituted after Napoleon's defeat in 1813-1814. The area between La Haison and Hougoumont was screened by skirmishers, including many from the 1st Light Battalion of the Legion. Baring's 2nd Light Battalion was, would hold La Haison itself, a routine deployment because light infantry were considered best for built-up areas, hand-to-hand -hand combat, and indeed any role which was not strictly defined in the standard manuals. Neither Wellington nor the Corps Commander, the Prince of Orange, nor the Divisional Commander, Von Alten, seemed to have given the farmhouse any great thought. Instead, the Legion's engineers were sent with all their tools to Hugo Mall. This was a surprising move because possession of the buildings was critical to the defense of the crossroads and thus the whole Allied center. Witnesses recall that the brigade commander, Omtera, was deeply dissatisfied by the defensive preparations made by the Corps Command, especially by the absence of any artillery in La Haison. He spent part of his night uh, Part of the night in conclave with Baring, Lieutenant Colonel von den Busch of the 1st Light Battalion, the Brigade Adjutant, Major von Einem, and his personal aide de camp, Captain von Brandy, in a room in the farmhouse beside a blazing fire and over a cup of hot soup. It must have been then that the decision was taken to fortify the place as much as possible. This was going to be a difficult task because the Legion's engineers were earmarked for Hougoumont, forsaking the warmth of the farmhouse. Omtetta spent the rest of the night around the staff watch fire of the 5th Line Battalion, a lonely and brooding figure. He refused all offers of a woolen blanket to protect him from the elements because the rank and file had strict orders from above not to use theirs, presumably so that they could react quickly in the event of a French surprise attack during the night. It was characteristic of the man that he would not ask his men to do anything that he was not prepared to do himself. At dawn on the 18th of June, Lindell was woken by rifleman Hartz, who demanded more wine. It was still raining heavily. Today is going to be a tough day, he said, and I'm going to die because I dreamed quite definitely that I would get a bullet through my body that did me no misfortune and that I slept contented. The farmhouse had become a hive of activity. It had stopped raining, and the garrison cast off its lethargy of the night before. Some of the men were put to cooking a pig, which, as Lieutenant Bitterman recalls, was slaughtered with more speed than skill. Hunger, the officer noted wryly, was not conducive to fraternity, because he himself received no meat but only a few peas and some salt. Others, despite the absence of suitable tools, knocked loopholes in the courtyard walls and erected a makeshift firing platform to enable the, others, uh, the other defenders to fire over them. Strenuous but inadequate efforts were made to block the gap left by the removal of the barn door. The banging and hammering must have made further sleep for the rest of the garrison impossible. Given that his canteen was now empty of wine, Lindau suggested to Hertz that they warm themselves by helping the neighboring British riflemen from the 95th Regiment to construct a barricade across the Brussels Road, flush with the south-facing courtyard wall. Most of the farm equipment, which had not been burned in the night, was now piled up in the road. Half a wagon, various farm implements, ladders, and three spiked French cannon. The obstacle was bolstered with several tree trunks and foliage cut down nearby. Later, Wellington's aide, Lord Cuffcart, remarked that it was not much of an obstacle at any time, and it was so flimsy that a party of friendly dragoons simply rode through it during the morning, forcing the long-suffering detail to rebuild it. For the British and German riflemen holding the road, however, it was better than nothing. 
While across the Allied line, the men stood to arms, the mental and physical state of the legionaries in light of the previous day's downpour, their lack of sleep, and the prospect of murderous battle against a seasoned foe can only be guessed at. Many of them must have been hungry, shivering, coughing, with running noses and blocked noses and the ears. Some will have been too excited to eat properly. The sun burst through at around 8 a.m., which brought some relief. The air erupted to the sound of weapons being cleaned and fired in order to establish whether they were still working at the, after the rain of the day and night before. Women camp followers were sent away to the rear on the Duke's orders. In the 5th Line Battalion of the King's German Legion, Lieutenant Wheatley watched the French maneuver on the opposing slopes. We could perceive, he writes, shoals of gloomy bodies gliding down, disjointing, then contracting like fields of animated clods sweeping over the plains, like melted lava from a volcano, boding ruin and destruction to whatever dared impede its course. It had a fairy look and bordered on the supernatural in appearance. At this moment, the assistant regimental surgeon, George Gerson, tapped him on the shoulder and remarked, That's a battle, my boy. That's something like preparation. Before adding as a two-edged parting shot that he was off to the hospital and hoped to see you there. Baring had six understrength companies, a total of 378 effectives. He had three senior officers, the second in command acting Major Bosville, as well as Captains Holzerman and Shulman. There were 11 lieutenants, Keisler, George Meyer, Christian Meyer, Lindham, Riff Google, Tobin, De Marvedon, Carey, Bitterman, Grime, and one whose name could not be deciphered. Below them came the five ensigns, Frank Smith, Baring, the teenage Von Robertson, and Timon, the adjutant. They were assisted by 24 sergeants and 14 buglers. Three medics, Surgeon Heiss, and his two assistant, Mueller and Geisa, were there to look after the wounded. The rank and file comprised 317 corporals and ordinary riflemen. If he made an eve of battle speech to his men, it's not recorded. All we know is that probably following his instructions, which have not survived, he told his officers to fight as long as they could and then withdraw to the main position. Baring stationed one company, about 80 men, in the kitchen garden under Lieutenant George Meyer to prevent the farm from being surrounded in order to maintain communications with the main position on the ridge. Surgeon Heisa and his two assistants set up their casualty station there in the shed. Two companies under Lieutenants Tobin and Graham were deployed in and around the courtyard where they took up positions along the wall in the dormer windows of the house and behind the barricade outside. Baring himself led three companies, about half the force, into the orchard to face the enemy. The situation was highly precarious. The farm was well to the front of the Allied line, with only two companies of the 1st Light Battalion under Major von den Busch and two companies of Hanoverian Feldjager, or Light Infantry, commanded by Major Sperkin, uh, spread out in skirmish order before him. To Baring's left lay two guns on the road and two experienced companies of the 95th Rifle Regiment in a sand pit on the far side. The bulk of the Allied infantry was at least 400 meters back, nearest being Lieutenant General Thomas Picton's 5th British Infantry Division. The surrounding courtyard, the surrounding countryside, smooth and undulating today, was then broken up by gullies in which enemy cavalry and skirmishers could lurk. Nor did Baring's riflemen enjoy a free field of fire. Despite all their efforts, the legionnaires were able to create only a handful of new firing positions in the buildings, while a rise in the ground just below the orchard blocked their vision of the French lines to the south. Surprisingly, neither Baring nor his superiors seemed to have made adequate provisions for the resupply of ammunition, either by laying in a reserve within the farm or having one nearby. <clears throat> this may have been because the two light battalions had had just one ammunition supply cart between them, and that had overturned into a ditch on the Brussels Road during the headlong retreat. As a result, Baring's battalion began the engagement with standard issue of only 60 rounds apiece, which had to suffice for the entire action. Whatever the reason, and whoever was responsible, it was a blunder for which the legionnaires would pay a heavy price in the afternoon. <clears throat> the French spent the morning in much the same way. At dawn, Corporal Conler recalls, every company took down their muskets in order to grease them, changed their clothes, and dried their bonnets. Even, at, even very senior officers, such as Marshal Derland's artillery commander, de Salle, had spent the night in the open and were consequently drenched to the skin. <clears throat> On rising, de Salle looked for and found a quiet place to change his clothes among the assorted wagons and coaches distributed across the French camp. His 40-plus cannon would wreak havoc on the Allied center that day. Meanwhile, the private soldiers were feeding themselves. One of our corporals, Kindler recalls, 
It was something of a butcher's boy, killed skin and cut into little pieces, our poor little lamb. The sheep was then cooked in butter. After an hour, the captain and the lieutenant of the company came to take part in our meal, which I hasten to add, tasted awful because instead of the salt we lacked, our cook had put a handful of gunpowder into the pot. Despite their miserable night, the shortage of food and the prospect of a hard fight ahead, morale among the men facing La Haison was high. When Napoleon passed by the 28th Line Regiment in the morning, he was greeted by a spontaneous movement which resembled an electric convulsion. Helmets, shakos, caps were borne up on sabers and bayonets with frenetic cries of long live the emperor. The emperor spent the night in a farm at Le Caillou, about six and a half kilometers to the south of the Allied position. To his intense relief, he found in the morning that Wellington had not slipped away under the cover of darkness, but was obviously preparing to give battle on the slopes of Mont Saint-Jean. Napoleon spent the early morning indoors contemplating the rain and the continued arrival of more of his army. His orderly, General Gorgo, informed him that the ground was too wet to permit an immediate attack. The emperor then reconno reconnoitered the battlefield on horseback, advancing, as he recalled, as far as his skirmishers opposite La Haison. Obviously concerned about the situation there, Napoleon sent the engineering officer, General Haxo, to investigate the Allied center. He reported correctly that there were no signs of field fortifications. He may not have taken in the frantic and rather ineffectual attempts to fortify the farmhouse. Napoleon was not overly worried about the Prussians, whom he believed to be in pre precipitate retreat eastwards, closely pursued by a large force under Marshal Grouchet. He was anxious, though, that the Duke might still elude him. For this reason, Napoleon could not waste much time on maneuvers, for example, by outflanking the Allied army to the west. Instead, he planned to grapple with Wellington through a frontal assault. He had about 74,000 men at his disposal, slightly more than the 68,000 in Wellington's army, and on average of higher quality. At 11 in the morning, Napoleon dictated his orders to Marshal Ney, who was to direct the principal French attack in the middle of the battlefield. The Emperor did not work out a detailed plan because he did not yet know the exact disposition of the Allied army. He therefore planned to begin with a probing attack by Ryle's 2nd Corps on Wellington's right at Hougoumont, designed to tie down his men there and force the Duke to commit some of his reserves. This would be followed by the main effort, a direct assault on the Allied center by Darlan's 1st Corps, beginning on the left and unfolding along the slope of Mont Saint-Jean to the right. Once Wellington had down shown the rest of his hand, the Emperor planned to commit his own reserves, including the Imperial Guard, if necessary. Napoleon's expectation was that once the main battle had been joined, the superior maneuvering skill of his troops would win the day over his more cumbersome opponents. That strategy, however, depended on forcing the enemy out of their well-established positions on the heights and in the fortified farmhouse. The main focus of the French plan was thus the Allied center and, in particular, its cornerstone, the farmhouse of La Haison. It is not clear whether Napoleon knew the buildings by that name, but of their importance to him, there can be no doubt. The Emperor's instructions called for the capture of the village of Mont Saint-Jean in order to seize the crossroads at that place, which can only refer to the farmhouse. Darlan's own rec recollection on this point is also absolutely clear. The second corps, he writes, must take the farm of Hugomont, and the first and the first corps must make itself master of La Haison, situated on the road to Brussels. The only light infantry regiment in the entire corps, the 13th, was given the task of capturing La Haison. Its sapper companies were instructed then to fortify the buildings against an allied counterattack. The capture of the farmhouse. It may be that Napoleon expected the weight of Darlan's mass column simply to submerge the buildings. It may be that he hoped that the capture of the ridge and thus the flanking of the farm would quickly render the garrison's position untenable. It may be that a preliminary shelling of the farmhouse was dismissed as a waste of resources given the limited caliber and number of guns available and the difficulty of hitting a target partially concealed by a dip in the ground. His information on the farm was certainly imperfect because it was only partially visible from his own position and none of his informants, including General Hoxo, have been able to get close due to the presence of enemy skirmishers. One way or the other, the failure to prepare the capture of La Haison more thoroughly was to cost him and his soldiers dear in the hours ahead. And I've elected to go ahead and read one more chapter here as I still feel pretty good. Chapter 4, Bolting the Barn Door. At around 11.30, Royal's 2nd Corps began its assault on Hugomont. The defending Nassauers began to fall back until reinforced by British guardsmen. 
Over the course of the day, the contest was to suck in more and more troops on both sides. The men at the Allied center, as Captain Carl Jacobi of the Hanoverian Lundberg Field Light Battalion recalls, were, quote, idle spectators for hours of the fighting that surged before them, particularly of the violent contest around Hougoumont. At around 1 p.m., Napoleon's Grand Battery opened fire on the center of the Allied line. The bombardment had no particular focus. The guns did not target any specific area, but subjected the whole of it to a general softening up. Given the ranges involved, that was about all that was possible until the spur of ground in front of La Haison, reconnoitered by the commander of the Grand Battery, de Salé, had been secured against rifle fire from the farm. For now, the purpose of the cannonade was as much, was as much psychological as physical, the delivery of moral, moral force to discourage the enemy from fighting. Napoleon intended, as his order to de Salé made clear, to astonish the enemy and shake his morale. It was shock and awe tactics. The Emperor's plan met with mixed success. Bilant's Netherlanders, who were deployed forward of the sunken road on the slope facing the French, suffered terribly. Most of the rest of the Corps, however, were safe enough on the reverse slope, where they were protected from direct fire and where they lay down or crowded into ravines to reduce their exposure. They also benefited from the fact that the French cannonballs tended to stick in the thick mud rather than bounce to cause further destruction. The light infantrymen, spread out in skirmish order along the Allied front, lacked such cover, but were sufficiently dispersed to avoid many casualties. One of the unlucky ones was Captain Philip Holzerman of the 1st Light Battalion, King's German Legion, who was killed shortly after the bombardment began, at around the same time as his wife, Mary Ann, was probably attending morning service in far off Bex Hill. Over the course of the day, his body was to be progressively ground into the soil beneath him. Many of the projectiles fell in the vicinity of La Haison, which was only 700 meters or so from the forward French batteries. The two Allied artillery pieces on the road outside were quickly destroyed after engaging the French in a futile duel against Wellington's strict orders. The men at the barricade scrambled for cover. Lieutenant George Simmons of the 95th Rifles had only just arrived with a pile of wood in time to see the flight of young Germans who were so alarmed that they blunderingly crossed in front of the guns, much to the amazement of more experienced men. In the sand pit nearby, Captain Najani Kincaid of the 95th Rifles saw a French cannonball, which came from Lord knows where, take the head off our right-hand man. The British riflemen, most of whom had been under heavy artillery fire before, were neither shocked nor awed, however. Likewise, for the veteran garrison of the farm itself, the cannonade was little more than an irritant. The men approaching the orchard were occasionally showered with branches shot off the tops of, th of the trees by cannonballs passing overhead. They were also at risk from splinters from explosive shells detonated above them. Otherwise, the sturdy masonry provided ample protection against the odd stray round. With the French assault imminent, Baring issued instructions to his company commanders. They were to hold on as long as possible and then withdraw to the main Allied line on the ridge behind. The officers of the 2nd Light Battalion now went to their assigned post, Lieutenant Meyer in the kitchen garden. Lieutenants Tobin and Graham in the buildings, bearing himself to the orchard and waited. After about half an hour, the French guns fell silent. This was to enable the 1st Corps to begin the main attack on the Allied center. Adjutant Major Huber, an old soldier who had fought in all of Napoleon's campaigns, was charged with forming up the divisions. When all was ready, the Corps commander, Darlon, placed himself at the center of the line and called out, We must vanquish or die today. The men shouted back, Long live the Emperor! Three drums beat, now announced the order to advance. About 18,000 men moved forward, preceded by a cloud of musket-armed skirmishers. They advanced in columns one battalion wide, and accounts differ nine or twelve battalions deep, a wider frontage than in the past. There's controversy about which formation was actually used. D'Arlon, a veteran of the peninsula, adopted this unusual formation over the more standard, smaller frontage columns in order to maximize French firepower against that of the feared British line formation he had encountered in Spain while retaining some of the mass necessary to punch its way through with the bayonet. <clears throat> it left his corps more vulnerable to cavalry attack, however. The infantry advanced in divisional order with the left flank out in front so that the attack would hit the Allied line like a swinging door from left to right. Behind them came cavalry in support, including nearly 800 cuirassiers, heavy cavalry protected by the metal breastplates which gave them their name. 
Within a few minutes, the attackers had accomplished the complicated passage of lines, marching through their own artillery without losing cohesion. Behind them, the Grand Battery resumed its bombardment of the Allied center, its rounds now hurtling over the heads of the advancing columns. Those on the extreme left of the French advance, Olar and Schmidt's brigades of General Doncelet's 2nd Infantry Division, were heading straight for the farmhouse of La Haison and would be the first to make contact with the enemy. As they descended into the valley separating them from Wellington's line, the French columns came under heavy and continuous Allied artillery fire. The German skirmishers, by contrast, began to withdraw. Corporal Kangler remembers a terrifying duet conducted by the two batteries made up of close to 200 guns. <clears throat> Cannonballs, bombs, shells passed and whistled above our heads. They'd hardly advanced 100 paces when the commander of the 28th Line, 2nd Battalion, Marin, was mortally wounded. Candler's own company commander was struck by two rounds. Old Hubar on the Eagle Bear Cross were also killed. It was more or less the same story across the French advance. We don't know for sure how the two brigades marching on Le Hasson fared, but the sapper companies in front, consisting of burly men with huge axes to batter down doors and barricades, must have suffered terribly not only from the Allied shelling, but also from the rifles of the German skirmishers in the field to the left of the farm. Despite the punishing fire, however, all along the line, the men heard the calm voice of our officers issuing the only command, close up. Marshal Ney accompanied the columns as far as the point where the road cut through the bank just before the farm. To the east of the farmhouse, the exposed Netherlanders of Bailan's brigade began to fall back. But the riflemen in the sand pit stood their ground for the time being. Captain Leach, who had a ringside view, described the din and fury of the French advance as if the bare possibility of our being able to withstand the shock was out of the question. His battalion adjutant, Captain Kincaid, recalls a huge column of infantry advancing with the cheers of Vive l'Empereur, carrying with them the rubadub of drums and the tantara of trumpets, their officers dancing and flourishing their swords in front. The French, he wrote, had some hopes of scaring us off the ground, but were met only by a stern silence reigning on our side, waiting to show them that we had mouths open to when we chose to use them. The Germans in the nearby farmhouse also showed no sign of anxiety. Napoleon's initial hope to frighten them out of the buildings through artillery fire and the mere threat of massed infantry attack had been disappointed. <clears throat> in the orchard, they could hear the French, the thump of thousands of human feet and horses' hooves as they churned up the muddy ground, but not see them. Then the first French skirmishers came over the slight elevation on the southern edge of the farm, cheering and loosing off a fusillade of bullets. Barion ordered the men to lie down, as they had so often before in the peninsula, presented a smaller target. The apple trees and low hedge of the orchard offered primarily psychological comfort. He himself, however, remained on horseback. Although hazardous, this was essential in order to give a good example to the men and maintain an overview of the battlefield. Barion gave strict instructions not to fire until the enemy was very close. Soon the two French main columns hove into the view, moving fast. One attacked the buildings while the other hurled itself into the orchard. The French are in such a hurry, the Germans told each other, it's as if they wanted to eat in Brussels today. It was now that the riflemen opened a deadly fire from the skirmish line in the field beside the farm. The hedge behind the orchard, the barricade, the courtyard walls, and the top windows of the house. We do not know exactly how many Napoleon's men were killed at that moment or throughout the day at Le Haisson. French sources estimate it to be as high as 2,000 all told by nightfall. What we do know is that th from this moment onwards, the ground around the farmhouse and soon the buildings themselves was strewn with bodies. The ubiquitous corpses were bad enough, but the sight and sound of the injured over the next five hours were even more distressing for those who witnessed them. The French skirmishers and the orchard halted and took aim. A hail of bullets sliced through the reins of Baring's horse, missing his hand by inches, killed riflemen hearts, thus vindicating the, his premonition. Seriously injured, one of the company commanders, Captain Shulman, and killed and wounded many more. The musket armed Frenchmen could keep up a much quicker rate of fire, probably two or three rounds a minute. The Germans could get off only about half that number because their grooved rifle bearers were slower to load. Muskets, being smoothbored, were unlikely to hit a man much more than 90 meters away, even if well aimed. Rifles, with their grooved barrels, on the other hand, were accurate at nearly twice that distance. At close range, as in this initial clash, massed and repeated musket volleys were more effective, but for most of the rest of the day, when the riflemen were firing at the French at some distance from the cover of the farmhouse, the Germans had the advantage. 
Both sides were now engaged in a process of attrition in which they race to aim, fire, and reload. This was done by holding the musket in the left hand, if right-handed, biting off the top of a prepared cartridge of, cartridge of powder and ball, retaining the ball in the mouth, pulling the cock or hammer back a notch. Then the soldier push, pushed the open, pushed open the frizzen covering the firing pan into which he poured some powder before sealing it again. The musket butt was placed in the ground, allowing the rest of the powder to be poured vertically into the barrel, followed by the cartridge paper and the ball either dropped or spat. The loader ran the package down with his ramrod once after the paper wadding in order to compact and seal the package and then after the ball. He then pulled the cock back another notch, took aim and fired. This released a flint which struck the frizzen, producing a spark which set off the powder in the pan and then in turn ignited the charge in the barrel propelling the bullet. Rifles were loaded in a similar fashion. Sometimes prepared paper cartridges were used, as with muskets. On other occasions, a pouch of lead balls and a powder flask were used. After pushing a measured charge of powder into the barrel, followed by a circular patch of greased cloth and the ball, the loader pushed down the package with his ramrod. The Baker rifle had a shorter barrel than the musket, making it easier to use from a prone position or in buildings such as a farm. There were plenty of things that could go wrong, even in fine weather, all bets were off if it was wet. The hammer might be released accidentally before it was pulled back all the way, leading to a misfire known as going off half, half cock. It was also possible that the flint would not produce a proper spark, or that the powder in the pan would simply not ignite, or that it would burn without setting off the charge in the barrel, the latter was known as a flash in the pan. Sometimes the weapons burst, injuring or even killing their owners. It was not uncommon to swallow the ball in the heat of battle, to spit it next to the barrel by mistake, to drop the cartridge, to spill the powder and it through clumsiness, to fire off the ramrod in error, or in the excitement to load and reload compulsively without actually firing. Even if the procedure passed off flawlessly, the infantry infantryman was left with blackened lips and a gritty taste in his mouth that never quite went away and made him very thirsty. Though the men in the orchard were completely outnumbered, they held their ground at first. The stricken showman was dragged back to the relative security of the farm, where he soon after died of his wounds. Then the rifleman noticed that the French column on their right was quickly working its way towards the open barn door. Some of the skirmishers strung out in the field outside saw the approach of French cavalry and retired upon up the hill to the main position. Others, under Captain Hans von den Busch, took a position in a semicircle in front of the barn door to the west. In the orchard, the Germans withdrew calmly, firing all the way. More men went down, including Baron's second-in-command, Major Balsaville, who was mortally wounded, raising himself off the ground only to collapse once more. Young Ensign Robertson was killed with a bullet to the head, falling just beside Captain Vaderman. Baron himself made the safety of the barn, but his horse's leg was smashed by gunfire, and he was forced to take that of his adjutant. For now, the barn entrance was successfully held, held by Von Dem Bush's skirmishers who shot down any approaching Frenchmen. Meanwhile, the second French column, Oliar's Brigade, approached the farmhouse from the southeast, advancing obliquely over the fields as well as down the high road. It quickly cleared the barricade on the road. Lieutenant Grime and the other men holding it beat a hasty retreat into the courtyard via the main gate. Corporal Wilhelm Weisse recalls the bullets whistling around their heads. An intrepid and hirsute engineer, Lieutenant Vach Vu, a graduate of the Ecole Polytechnique, ran up and hacked, hacked furiously at the gate with an axe. When he was injured and the tool slipped from his grasp, it was picked up by another man, but the gate stood firm. The rest of the blue tide crashed against the unyielding courtyard walls and, stu and stout wooden gate and swirled to the right up the route, up the road towards the main Allied position. Bilant's brigade, which had taken the brunt of the French cannonade, fell back in a complete disorder. Only one of five battalions held the line. The British riflemen in the sand pit and the Germans on the eastern side of the house, however, had a perfect view of the advancing French, who were now raked from the front and left with accurate fire. Sometimes three or four attackers were felled by a single round, blasted at close range by powerful rifles through the loopholes in the wall or from the piggery on which about a dozen legionnaires were posted. Using the angling of the dormer windows to deadly effect, marksmen picked off the French officers at will, often shooting beyond effective musket range. Unlike the Germans who could at least bring their wounded indoors, the injured Frenchmen could only stagger back towards their own lines. Many others lay writhing where they had fallen. 
Despite this tableau of devastation, the French column plowed on up the hill, driving the British riflemen out of the sand pit back to the main Allied position. Some of the attackers now swung left and piled into the kitchen garden, held by Lieutenant Meyer's solitary company. The rest soon reached the ridge where they were hotly engaged by the British 5th Division, killing their famous commander, Thomas Picton, with a shot to the head close to the crossroads. The whole Allied center was now in immediate danger of being overrun. Wellington, who had moved from Hougoumont with his staff to an elm tree near the crossroads at around 1.30 p.m., instantly realized the gravity of the situation. Either he, the Prince of Orange, or General von Alten now ordered the Hanoverian Light Infantry Battalion of Lunenburgers to advance toward La Haison to support Bering, while Colonel Umpteda's 5th and 8th King's German Legion Line Battalions were told to move up to the sunken road. Wellington's also, Wellington also instructed the 1st Light Battalion of the King's German Legion to plug up the gap to the left of the farmhouse. Now it is your time, my lads, Captain Christoph Heiss, the acting adjutant of the battalion, heard him call out to the Germans. Two companies of German light infantrymen, commanded by Captain von Gielse and Lieutenant Albert, surged out of the ravines where they had taken cover from French artillery fire. They raced over the road past abandoned British guns, formed up to the left and rear of the French column, and fired into the dense masses as fast as they could reload. Others made for the kitchen garden. Corporal Henry Muller positioned himself at the far end in order to pick off the officer leading the French column. Thanks to the help of riflemen Sasse and Schulermann, who reloaded his weapon for him, he succeeded in knocking out the Frenchman from his horse with a first shot. The enemy began to fall back. At this point, Captain Heiss was badly injured in the leg and was helped back towards the Allied line by British riflemen until the intense fire forced him to abandon his charge. Luckily for Heiss, Rifleman Sander of the 1st Light Battalion now observed his captain's distress and dragged him to a steep bank where both men spent an anxious few minutes trying to avoid the attentions of prowling French cavalry. Sander refused Heiss's injunctions to save himself, and when they were finally spotted by a French rider, the rifleman shot the horse from under him. Without taking off his weapon or backpack, Sander slung a superior over his shoulders and carried him to a surgeon at Mont Saint-Jean before returning to the fray. Sander's dedication was remarkable, it was well known that some uninjured Hanoverians, like many, many soldiers in all armies, were not above using the need to help a wounded comrade off the battlefield as an excuse to quit the fight altogether. As Omtetta's men pushed the French down the hill to the east of the farmhouse with the fixed bayonets, he sent his adjutant forward through the, through the smoke, which von Brandy recalls as being so thick that one couldn't see a thing. In order to establish whether they were facing enemy cavalry or infantry, he almost immediately ran into a force of cuirassiers. The 1st Light and the 5th Line battalions were covered by British cavalry nearby and had time to form square, though Omtera had a narrow escape, when his horse was shot. Unfortunately, the 8th Battalion was still in the line when the French struck and was routed in a few traumatic minutes, apparently without having had the opportunity or at least the will to resist. Its commander, Lieutenant Colonel von Schrader, was mortally wounded. Captains von Hoyt and von Westernhagen Lieutenant von Marathon Holtz and more than 30 non-commissioned officers and men were rapidly killed. Many of the other officers were wounded, some badly. And St. Moreau suffered three serious injuries and was forced to drop the colors close to the farm. Seeing this, Sergeant George Stockman of the 2nd Light Battalion ran out to retrieve the flag and thus saved it from falling into enemy hands. Major von Petersdorf managed to rally some of the men behind the sunken road, but the battalion was finished as a coherent fighting force and took no further part in the fighting. It was the first of a number of object lessons that day and in the danger which cavalry posed to infantry which had been caught in the open and unable to form square. On the other side of the farmhouse, all went well at first. The Lunenburgers advanced down the slope under the command of Lieutenant General von Klenke, Though with more speed than good order, they quickly pushed back the French. One company under Captain Jacobi recaptured the orchard and linked up with Bering's men who had reemerged from the, from the courtyard. The rest deployed in open formation in the fields outside to keep French skirmishers at arm's length. It didn't take long, however, before another enemy column approached. Despite the efforts of twice wounded Sergeant Major Ludwig Schmidt to rally the men, the low and skimpy hedges gave too little protection to enable sustained resistance. The Germans in the orchard fell back into the field outside where they became caught up in with the rest of the Lunenburgers. 
Suddenly, a force of French heavy cavalry, cuirassiers, commanded by Colonel Crabet, appeared out of a fold in the ground and prepared to attack. At this very moment, Lieutenant Meyer reported that the French had surrounded the kitchen garden and made his position there untenable. Baring ordered him to retire to the house and to continue the fight there, and, the and then turned to face the enemy cavalry. In the den, however, neither Baring nor von Klinke could make the themselves heard in order to form square or at least some sort of defensive perimeter. To make matters worse, the arrival of the Lunenburgers had disrupted the close formation of von den Busch's riflemen of the 1st Light Battalion King's German Legion outside the barn, so that, so that they too were unable to give effective covering fire. It took only a few awful moments for the entire Lundberg Battalion and the accompanying legionnaires to be completely dispersed. They did not seem to have put up much of a fight. The crosshairs were quickly on top of them, hacking and slashing at the disordered infantrymen with their swords. Some, such as the Lunenburgers Corporal W. Buren, Privates Fra uh, Pape, H. Schuler, J. Reisse, and S. C. Klopp, made it to the safety of the farmhouse where they spent the rest of the day with the garrison. On the way, Klopp, who was already injured, managed to run an enemy officer through with his bayonet. Most headed for the main Allied line, exposing themselves not only to the swords of the pursuing cuirassiers, but also to the enfilading fire of the French infantry spilling out of the kitchen garden. Sergeant Schmidt suffered further injuries from cavalry swords. Von Klinke, too, was hurt. Some of the Germans were shot by their own side, hit by volleys which the squares fired at the approaching cavalry. Captain Biderman describes how the men in the main position were already taking aim as I arrived at the square, so that I had no choice but to throw myself quickly to the ground and to crawl the last few paces to safety. Both von Klinke and Baring also made it, and together with the survivors took refuge in the brigade squares where von Klinke's wounds were tended to, but many did not. Captain Jacoby had a miraculous escape, even though groups of en enemy riders trotted past him only 10 or 12 paces away. The trauma of the charge caused him severe temporary sensory deprivation. There were moments, Jacoby recalled, when the senses of hearing and sight had in fact shut down, and not just figuratively so. The French did not, however, capture the farmhouse and courtyard. As Berrien looked on impotently from their main position, Lieutenants Graham and Curry and Ensign Frank held out stubbornly with the rump of the battalion and some stragglers from the Lunenberg Field Battalion. At this moment, the defenders probably amounted to no more than a few dozen. The barn remained the site of a furious contempt contestation. Fortunately for the French, did not try to climb up the, its walls, and the legionaries were able to snipe at them from the top of the pigsty. On the other hand, the men on the courtyard walls facing the road were frustrated by their own barricade outside, behind which the French were now taking cover. When Lieutenant Graham nipped out of the side door, which opened onto the road in order to observe the enemy, he was immediately set upon by three Frenchmen who disarmed him and tried to drag him away. Sergeant Dietrich Meyer came up to his help and succeeded in freeing Graham, but received a musket blow to the head for his pains, was knocked out and himself taken prisoner. Nearby, the French brought forward three 12-pounder batteries flush with La Haison to support their launched attack on the main Allied line, and perhaps also to batter the building to submission from close range. These moments were the nearest the farmhouse came to falling in the early afternoon. Relief came from outside. The British household and Union cavalry brigades charged the advancing and disorganized French. Within minutes, much of Darlan's corps, especially Allure's brigade around La Haison, was fleeing down the slope back toward the Grand Battery. The three French 12-pounders were quickly overrun, and it would be many hours before Napoleon succeeded in getting any guns at close to the buildings again. For a while, the British riders were held up by French skirmishers in the kitchen garden and sand pit, as well as French cuirassiers. The, the air resounded to the distinctive crash of swords on helmets and breastplates. You might have fancied it was so many tinkers at work, Lord Somerset recalled. At around this time, the legendary boxer Corporal Shaw of the Second Lifeguards was unhorsed by a carbine shot and crawled to the courtyard walls of La Haison, where he bled to death soon, though, the enemy were driven past the farm where an exultant Lieutenant Weymouth of the Second Lifeguards observed Lieutenant Graham still banning his post on the roof of the pigsty. As they galloped further down the slope, the household men were blasted but not deflected by French skirmishers in the orchard. Shortly after, the lifeguards and the cuirassiers became wedged between the two high banks of the Nap Road, 
just beyond the farm before the British cavalry hacked their way through. Heartened by their success and perhaps carried along by natural momentum, the two brigades charged and temporarily overran the Grand Battery. Then, their formation scattered and their horses blown, the British horsemen were in turn attacked by French lancers and very roughly handled. Meanwhile, the French had scrambled into square around the orchard of La Haison. The crisis was over, but the net result of the action was to knock most of d'Erlon's corps, and thus the majority of the French infantry, out of the fighting until the late afternoon. For the next few hours, much of the French center was reduced to the role of spectators while the officers tried to rally their men. Corporal Canla was one of those reduced for much of the rest of the afternoon to manning a picket line established to corral the fugitives and return them to their units. Only Dorothée's division on the far right of the French line, furthest away from La Haison, was relatively unscathed. The charge of the British cavalry greatly eased the pressure on La Haison, at least for a while, as the French infantry retired past the farm. Lieutenant Graham led a sortie through the front gate. The Germans plunged their bayonets into the tightly packed enemy mass like blind men in a rage. As Lindau recalled, the French were chased well beyond the barricade where they soon surrendered when the cavalry caught up with them. Graham regarded those men for a time. Until then, returning British hussars led them away to captivity. <coughs> now the communication with the main position had been reestablished. Byron returned to the farm and the 95th rifle sneaked back into the sand pit. The legionnaires took up position again behind the barricade from where they traded fire with French skirmishers in the orchard and further down the slope. They now had an opportunity to survey the scene of carnage around the farm, which was literally covered with dead and injured bodies, most of them from the enemy side. Lying dead or dying in the mud were Olar himself, the brigade commander, Rignon, the commander of the 51st line, Bonnet, the commander of the 2nd Battalion of the 105th Regiment, and Morin, the commander of the 2nd Battalion of the 28th Line, as well as many more junior officers in rank and file. <clears throat> At least as many were wounded. Lieutenant Graham records, records that even his oldest soldiers had never witnessed such a sight. He saw one poor Frenchman in a puddle who was so badly hurt that he ineffectually attempted to kill himself with his own sword before being prevented by the riflemen who did not know whether he survived. The German wounded were carried to the casualty station in the recaptured kitchen garden, where they were tended to by Sergeant or Surgeon Heuse and his assistants. We have no records of their work, but can only have been grueling. A report by John Hattie James, the assistant surgeon of the First Lifeguards, described the hasty surgery, the awful sights, the blood-soaked operating table, the agony of an amputation, however swiftly performed, and the longer agony of a probing. Most of the wounds would have been from bayonets, sabers, or musket rounds. The latter tended to punch rather than stab a victim, soft lead ball deforming on impact, shattering or tearing off limbs, and frequently requiring painful amputations without any anesthetic beyond alcohol. Very soon, the casualty station in the outhouse must have overflowed, and the less serious cases, and perhaps some of the hopeless ones as well, were probably dropped up against, propped up against the inside courtyard walls where it was still relatively safe. We know that by the end of the siege, wounded soldiers were also sent to lie on the beds on the first floor of the farmhouse itself. Surveying the situation, Baring found his command much reduced. Three of his officers, Balsaville, Schulman, and Robertson, were dead. Six wounded and some 70 of the rank and file were either killed, taken prisoner, still back behind the sunken road, seriously injured, or otherwise and incapacitated. At least one of his officers, Lieutenant Baderman, did not return from the main position and saw out the rest of the battle from one of the squares there. <clears throat> At most, 300 men of his original force remained, augmented by a few stragglers from the Lunenburgers from von den Busch's companies and perhaps some of Sparkin's Hanoverian Jager. Baron now requested reinforcements. Wellington reacted with the dis dispatch of two companies from the 1st Light Battalion, more riflemen commanded by Captains von Gielsa and Heinrich von Marschall. These were sent to the kitchen garden. Baron decided not to reoccupy the orchard, probably because he did not have enough men to hold such an extensive perimeter. He himself joined the rump of the battalion, sheltering from the incessant shelling as best they could in the courtyard and waited. And in the next section, we will begin with chapter 5, entitled Inferno.